All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And I always say this, and everybody's probably getting tired of me saying it, but I'm going to say it again. I'm super excited about this episode that we're going to have today. I've got it lined up for us, another fantastic guest. Uh, about six weeks ago, maybe, depending on when this episode launches, I made a, a post about, or I made an episode about the pivot that I wanted to do within the podcast. And I wanted to focus more of my uh, topics, more of my guests about uh, health and wealth and legacy, because those are the things that are the most top of mind for me and my family and the things I'm looking at, things I'm in, investing in, things I'm uh, learning about, educating myself on. And so I'm out there actively trying to find folks to bring on as guests here the podcast. And ironically enough, the person that I have today with us actually reached out to me. He heard that episode and he was actually the one I was referring to, which is kind of funny uh, when you think about it. I was referring to him. Uh, I didn't name him by name in the episode, but for him to reach out to me first, that was a lot of fun. But today I have with us Gary Pinkerton. And Gary is a successful entrepreneur. He's a motivational speaker and a real estate investor. Gary uses 30 years of ethical leadership gained at the U.S. Naval Academy and honed as a nuclear attack submarine commander to improve the lives of his clients through his work as a wealth strategist at Paradigm Life. And Gary is, he's part of my team. I'll be quite honest with you. He has come into my life and my family's life here in the last, I would say, 12 months or so, and he's really helped me start to craft a vision of what my life for my family and a legacy standpoint, and also from a wealth standpoint, could be moving forward. So I'm super excited to have him on here today. We're going to talk all types of different topics from a wealth standpoint, from a legacy standpoint. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, my father, unfortunately, when he passed, he didn't have anything set up for myself, for my brother, uh, my family. And when that happened, I swore to myself and to my family that that would not happen to me. I have a lot of things set up today that I didn't have, obviously, back then. But I still have more to learn, and that's why I'm excited to get along here with Gary and then have him come on and teach me and teach us. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, Gary, with, I'll quit talking and babbling, but, man, I just appreciate you coming on. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Randy. I, uh, I, I have rich mind in my head, right? And so we're very good friends, and I'm, I'm proud to call you a client and a friend, a uh, longtime close friend. Uh, I, I got to tell you, with rich mind being uh, the name of the podcast, which is an awesome name, uh, I, I want to nickname you rich and work it really hard <laughs> not to create my own nickname for you. Uh, but Randy, it's just, you know, we go back so many years and you may not have been thinking, well, you didn't say my name. You didn't call me out specifically, but I felt you were speaking right to my soul uh, because you said, Hey, I want to talk about the things that are most important in your life, Gary. And so, man, I really appreciate you uh, having me on. Uh, I think I offered, Hey, I'll do as many episodes as, uh, until I wear you out. Uh, so I as well. I'm excited uh, for what we have coming up today. Awesome. Yeah, this, it's going to be a lot of fun. And so the hope, and we'll see folks. So we're going to be asking for some feedback. We need some feedback from you to learn uh, from you, what you're taking from these episodes or from this episode to start with questions, uh, anything out there that you have, please let us know. Uh, we're trying to educate as much as we possibly can. I don't proclaim to know everything. That's why I bring on experts like Gary to help me even navigate some of this stuff, you know, this life stuff, right? The legacy pieces, the wealth pieces. And so that way we can make better decisions out there in life. So if we get enough questions, if we get enough feedback, then yeah, hopefully we'll be able to bring Gary back on and it'll be a lot of fun. I guarantee those episodes, if we can do that, will be a lot of fun as well. So I appreciate the offer for sure. Yeah. So, you know, you were sharing about your father and, and, you know, maybe that's one of the things that kind of bonds us together or brings us together. My, my story, very similar. Um, my father passed when I was uh, 19 years old and it was, it was always in really kind of poor health. Plus he was probably uh, 45, I think when I was born. So an older gentleman, uh, he was a dairy farmer and, you know, it, it had always been his dream to uh, have a farm and, and, um, you know, raise his children um, on that farm. And so this was, uh, so I'm 55 and it was, uh, you know, almost the same age as you, I think, Randy. And, uh, so this was the late seventies, early eighties. I went to high school in uh, 1984, I think 1983, maybe. Uh, and that was about the time where, uh, Paul, um, so Paul Volcker head of the uh, uh, federal reserve and, uh, Ronald Reagan kind of got together and Reagan said, Hey, let's, fix inflation. Because by that point, we'd had like 10 years of what we've been experiencing here the last couple of years. We had gas lines, we had OPEC crises, 
um, we had this thing called the misery index, right? I think that uh, your previous guest ha had mentioned that recently, um, brought back memories for me because it was this thing about um, stagflation, which kind of that term started to become popular here again recently. And it's just an, an experience where people's costs, their expenses are going up faster than their income. And so they had this, they had figured out how to make ends meet. And then all of a sudden they stopped meeting. Uh, and, and the economy is slowing down and it's this environment where people, if you lose your job, like you're not getting another one. Um, and so, you know, Reagan really came in with the desire to change that for America. You know, he has, he has this old joke where he said, um, uh, a recession, uh, is where your neighbor loses his job and a depression is where you lose your job. And then he was like, a recovery is when Jimmy Carter loses his. So Jimmy Carter was a, a fellow Naval Academy graduate, uh, you know, really an awesome gentleman, just just had his 100th birthday, really an incredible guy. Um, yet his his method, his his concepts of economics just didn't work out like they did not. It wasn't what we needed at the time. Uh, and, and so, again, it was just, you know, I'm trying to paint this picture. It was fairly tough times when you and I were growing up. Um, we had this large dairy farm and. Um, you know, it, it was uh, it, it was a great place. Um, and I think if I'm doing this correctly, you're seeing now I'm, I'm going to try to share a screen for those who can see it. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it was uh, it was a place of, again, poverty, but it was it was 700 acres, 150 head of cattle, d dairy cattle. My father, you know, milked cows every morning, and every afternoon. So I certainly understood the idea of work ethic. Yeah, what was happening there in the late 70s and early 80s was that interest rates were rising into the teens. And then for one brief moment, 1984, they got to 21% where we lived. And all of the farmers to recover from that were basically refinancing every few months when, when the teaser loan rate went away. So we'd have this rate for three months or six months. And then that would reset to something massively bigger. And we'd have to go refinance again, pull out the equity. And, and so while the all hard assets out there were going up in value like they had the last couple of years. Our loans, most farmers I knew, our loans were all going up as fast or faster than that. So we were just getting deeper and deeper in debt. 1983, the bank came to us and said, hey, you, you got six months. And so we basically got out with a shirt. Uh, my father got out with a shirt on his back, but his, his health and his spirit and everything really pretty broken. So I found myself in high school um, in the middle of this same kind of economic environment, um, not hanging out with my buddies, but rather uh, doing small jobs in this beat up machine shed uh, and this, you know, next to the, thankfully, my uncle had a, a used uh, mobile home that uh, on his land that we were able to live in during that period. Mom uh, got her first job, uh, first W2 job ever. And it really kind of settled things out and enabled my sister and I to go off and, and go to college. And all I wanted, though, uh, was two big things. One was to get out of Illinois far enough that I didn't come back. And the second was a safe, secure W-2 job. And so that whole thing that Robert Kiyosaki says to us all the time, you know, that, that you know, you hear this mantra, which is bad uh, advice to, you know, you know, study hard, get a good job uh, so that you're safe and secure for the rest of your life. That's what I was after 100%. And I, I chased that for a long time. Um, I always liked, uh, my dad took me one time to the uh, Arsenal what's it called? The Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. The only one of the few family trips we ever took, because again, he had to be there most mornings and afternoons to milk the cattle. And and so I really wanted to be a rocket scientist. And I know how silly that sounds, but it's what I wanted to do. And so when I got to the Naval Academy, I found out that um, that, that inspiration was still there. And the closest thing we had at the Naval Academy to rocket science was nuclear submarines. And so I got excited and, and involved in doing that. And, you know, you and I talk often um, about, actually, you know, you know, Randy, probably the most compelling thing is about about wealth and legacy and what they are and which is, you know, which are they any different? Like, is there a difference in them? And I've learned over the years, um, I thought they were the same thing. I thought the legacy was the wealth that you created, that you passed to your kids. I've since learned after watching a lot of families get messed up being humbled by how little that I've been successful, and at least in my own mind, of, of teaching my own kids, uh, that I now understand that wealth is what you, is the money, the monetary value that you leave to future people, uh, and the legacy is what you leave inside them. And the legacy is far more important than the wealth. And it's also, this is the humbling part, far harder to do. And so I've dedicated my life now to helping individuals get on a path to protect and grow wealth. Um, and then provide them the tools that are necessary to create and propagate a legacy. 
to me, that's the most important. I'm going to take a breath here um, and see if I'm on the right path there, Mr. Randy. No, yeah, absolutely. So that's that. Yes. Meaning. So as I've stated in the past, I'm learning as we go. And I didn't necessarily have someone in my life to teach me and help me even understand what that even meant. I loved how you just Mm -hmm. shared that too. I think that'll hit home for folks. If you really take that in the difference between wealth and legacy, um, because they're very important and you're right with children of my own. And now as a grandparent as well, it is very difficult to instill uh, different things, different ideas, different uh, belief systems and that type of thing to carry on different legacies that I want the Wilsons to be known for right in the communities in the places that we serve, that type of thing. So yes, I love yeah. everything you've shared so far. That's fantastic. Thank you. So I have two huge lessons that carry me forward when I interact with clients for uh, as a wealth strategist, developing you know strategy and, and purpose and intent in their life. And the first one was the one that I learned as a kid. You know, when you become homeless and you're all embarrassed at the clothes and the cars and things that you show up in in front of all the girls, right? As a guy, as a young guy. Like those are impressionable things. And it caused me to focus on material things. Initially, I admit that first 20 years of my adult life was pretty much just growing the dollar signs, getting to that million or whatever. Uh, and But then as I reflect back on it, the true lesson that I learned back there was how to protect what you worked so hard to achieve in the face of inflation. And so I, I used to always say, when there's inflation, you need to have hard assets. And then I, you know, I reflect on that. I'm like, hey, silly. Uh, there's always inflation in the modern world. Like every country out there is operating under fiat currency. And and so if the inflation is going to be there, sometimes very large, sometimes small, uh, you have to protect from it from day one. And how you protect from that is get hard assets, right? But there's different kinds of hard assets. I think gold and silver are fantastic. They're wonderful ideas. Yet as my good friend and mentor in the real estate world taught me a decade ago, and there's, you know, there's a difference between gold and silver and real property, real estate. And there's a lot of advantages in the real property side. Like if you buy them all for cash, they can do similar things. Um, But if you want to actually put flippers on and swim upstream against the current, which is inflation, which is pushing all of this towards that waterfall, you know, and going over Niagara Falls, if you want to go the other direction, not just be safe, but go the other way, um, you need to put those flippers on. And the way you do that is use prudent, leveraged, fixed rate loans on things like real estate that have universal needs. So whether it's your own business that is in a service or product industry that is unlikely to be replaced by AI or something else uh, or go out of style, um, you know, either that in a business or real estate, real property, either way, if you can figure out how to leverage that with fixed rate loans, uh, have people rent it from you, pay it off for you, it makes all the difference in the world. And so just real quick on the real estate side, I use the acronym. I didn't make this up, but it has always stuck with me. I use the ac- the acronym that real estate is an ideal investment. And it just, you know, the, the acronym is income. So that's the cash flow you're getting because somebody's renting it from you. Um, deductions, uh, which is mainly depreciation, a kind of a phantom deduction that you didn't actually expense it, but you still get to deduct it. Uh, and then the actual expenses that you have, you get to deduct those against the income. And then there's equity. So equity is the tenant paying off the mortgage for you. So you put 20% down, you get five times the asset that you could have gotten if it was gold or if you paid cash for the house. And then somebody pays that off for you, right? And then there's appreciation. So I don't like the idea that we're devaluing the currency, that we're causing inflation, uh, but it's there and we're living in that world. So we're in the river. Let's decide how to figure out how to swim against it, right? And so that's appreciation side. And then leverage. And so leverage, when you put prudent leverage in place, which means you don't have variable interest rates, which causes you to go bankrupt like it did for us, um, that prudent long-term fixed rate loans that only Americans can get um, is, is something that allows you to really kind of magnify that appreciation. So if the appreciation's out there at 4%, let's just say it's 4%, and, and you only put 20% down, well, you're getting five times leverage, which means that year, instead of 4%, you got 20% um, on that. You add that to the tax benefits, the cash flow, the income, like all of a sudden you, you turn around and you're like, wow, uh, I felt like, you know, I had to do a couple of repairs and I didn't make any money on that thing. But when I, when I'm all in and look at all the different sides of it, that was a multi, you know, those double digit returns easily. And so real estate to me, massive. And then the other one was about control over your resources. So those of you that are joining us on YouTube, I have a picture here of my time when I had command of the USS Tucson from 
you know, essentially 2008 to 11 was that that era. And I had um, saved everything and, and had a great 1990s stock market economy and all my money was in the markets back then. And so I had uh, grown it pretty aggressively. And my wife and I felt like we were in a position where I could leave fairly early, you know, barely over 20 years in the Navy and, um, you know, go off and spend time around my boys. Because I was at that point where I was starting to reflect that these young guys are growing up quickly. I don't know them that well. And they don't they don't go to dad to ask questions. And I haven't been giving them, imparting on them that stuff that I learned from my dad. And that's really when it started clicking for me, that wealth, something he didn't give us a penny of, like you mentioned with your dad is completely different than legacy. And, you know, I still had this book where my dad and I for like a week and a half went around the farm as we were doing chores. And he was pointing out different kinds of trees, the leaves on these different trees, because I had a project on being able to identify all these different trees. I can still go to Illinois and point out 25, 30 different species of trees um, because of the time my dad spent with me doing that, you know, and that's just one example. So there's, you know, legacy can come with absolutely no money. Right. And, and it's super important. It has to come with time. And I've also learned over time, you can't short circuit. that. You, you just can't. You just put in the time like that's the answer. Right? And so every time my boys, you know, you and I have been with our children on the Real Estate Guys Summit. Right. And that's a week plus 10 days away from your business. It's expensive. Um, but every time when my boys raise their hand and say they want to do it, I'm just going to keep doing it if I can financially do so. Uh, because, you know, they're going to stop asking someday if I'm not continuing to add value and, you know, and legacy in their world. So the, pic the picture on the right hand side, if you if you can see it about that submarine, the point of that is control because I had that submarine from 2008 to 11, essentially. That was the entire Great Recession. And so I go into this with the intention to leave after this amazing opportunity I've wanted for years of commanding this nuclear submarine. And it was a great experience. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was the greatest experience too. Uh, and, and I was going to leave right after that and go spend time with my boys. Well, what happened was during the Great Recession with me paying absolutely no attention I lost half my money, you know, so it was the kind of basically the casino that allowed me to go up without any true, like I was probably taking credit for it, but it wasn't my credit. Um, and it wasn't my credit when it all fell down again, right? Like I was along a roller coaster for the ride. And so today I talk with clients about how can we reposition the assets in our lives so that we maintain maximum control? Like how do we invest in the most important assets, the ones that are have more likelihood of growing faster? And then how do we control the end game? How do we control the future, the results of what's going to happen? And so, you know, some of that is protection. Some of it is just gaining knowledge ourselves. But some of it is also um, not just handing money off to people that you don't know that are going to do things with it you don't know, right? There's risk when you do that. So thoughts, thoughts on that or any kind of redirect? No, I agree with that as well. So uh, I'm a huge advocate of self-education, huge advocate of doing and gaining a, a team, right? Putting a team together mm -hmm. of, of advisors, really, that are going to help you make the decisions for yourself. You don't blindly, you mentioned yeah. in that 08 to 2011 part for yourself that you literally were under the water and not paying attention mm -hmm. and things were going on, right? That were out of your control, but you were in a position because of yeah. your uh, your work at that moment, you couldn't take a visa of action to get yourself even in a better position from what I understand. So yeah. yes, folks listening to us today, I would just, we've, you, in my opinion, this is my opinion. I think you would back me up on this, Gary, is that you've got to take control to the best of your ability, but get yourself a team of some team of advisors. Yeah. Like yeah. Gary is for myself. Yeah. You can get some virtual advisors as well. Right. But I, I recorded an episode right before we recorded here today, Gary. And one of the things I talked about on there was true professionals, not folks that are out there talking about theories and ideas and challenge those people with finding folks that are actually in the the world, right? Doing yeah. exactly what you're trying to do. If you're wanting to be a real estate investor, make sure you're following true real estate investors and learn from them. I've seen it and I've almost fallen into it myself. You'll a trap of thinking you can just figure it out on your own or else you're following somebody that's saying that something always happens or it's always going to go up or nothing. There's never any problems yeah. here. Yeah. And then you get bombarded with some negative on the back end. Anyways, I guess I just want to make sure people understand control is, is very important. Self-education is also very important, but collecting your team of advisors. So that way you can make the best decisions for you and your situation. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I've also made the mistake of um, trying to push the easy button from Staples or whatever that was from Office Max or I don't know what it was, but you know, the easy, but everybody knows the easy button. Um, I'd been trying to push that like, oh man, this passive thing, this is amazing mailbox money. Um, and, and we're like, well, it's my advisor, right? But, but we have to be careful that we're not abdicating focus or, or attention. And you, you can't just outsource any aspect of your life. You know, Tom Ziegler, a great friend, mutual friend of ours has, has these things that, you know, he and his dad had developed over time about the different, um, aspects of your life, the, the important, uh, parts of your life you know, family, friends, um, you know, and uh, the spiritual side, uh, your financial side, your fitness, right? You can't, you can't outsource any of these things, truly can't outsource them. We've been kind of taught by Wall Street that you can outsource the financial side, but in reality, it doesn't work any better than outsourcing your fitness or, you know, like you work out, you seem to be good at it, you work out and uh, make sure that I'm in good shape, right? Or you know, you seem to be good with uh, relationships with with women. So, you know, you you make sure that my, my wife is never gets mad at me, right? Like that, none of this stuff works. And, and yet we've made this, we've flipped this switch that it does work financially. And it is not my experience that it has, not for the not for the most successful out there. And so kind of pulling that control down as best we can. First, I think it is recognizing that there are, there's not just one thing to focus on. So uh, one of the things that my clients have taught me and Patrick Donahoe, my partner at Paradigm Life has taught me is, is that, you know, most people focus on one path, but yet there are two really important parallel paths out there. And there's a protection path. Um, and that's talking about protecting from things like liability, disability, and death. And, a, and just a conversation about what amount, what type, when do I need those different kinds of protection during my journey? Uh, and then there's the, the, uh, wealth accumulation path, which is all about the capital, like money that we need for short-term needs and intermediate type things like maybe kids college or a beach home or something. And then the long-term things like our retirement and that legacy for future generations. And the reason there have to be both of these paths is because growing long-term wealth is this big, long exponential curve. And you have this target that's way out there in the future. I mean, it depends on what your, your goal is. It might be retiring six years from now, uh, but it but it might be making sure that my grandchildren a hundred years from now have um, the ability to start their own business and do something for their grandchildren, and and so regardless, if you have a big goal, it takes a while to get there. And I think one of the things that most people don't appreciate is that most of that progress happens way out on the right hand side, and you have to make it along the curve. You have to stay in the game for this to work. And protection is what gets you in the game. Right. And it could be asset protection. So you don't lose your assets because somebody sues them, sues you for them. And maybe it's errors and in emission insurance. If you ha if you're a provider and somebody tries to sue you saying that you caused them to lose money or something. Uh, but the most important asset is ourselves. Right. And so there are people out there that will say, um, that, you know, don't, uh, you know, use term insurance. And then when the kids are out of the house, uh, just self insure. Well, self insuring isn't a misnomer. It means you're not insured. It means you're taking your own wealth. And you're going to use that instead of having insurance. Um, and I think if you had a $1 million 1960s a race winning Ferrari, that would probably be a $10 million one, but whatever. It's a million dollar car. Um, and you don't need it because you got this beat up old 10 year old Honda that you drive around that's super dependable. Um, it doesn't matter if somebody steals the Ferrari or it's not going to change your ability to go to work, right? So ah, uh, heck with it. Just don't insure it, right? Like we intelligently wouldn't do that. But yet we uninsure the number one asset, the human, right? And so I'm extremely proud to say that I used to defend America, but now I'm defending families by ensuring that they understand that the number one asset should be protected for the entire time that you have that asset in play, which means you're alive. And so I love to step out there and say, I'm a life insurance guy. And yes, there's lots of cool, uh, there's lots of cool movies about Needle Nose Ned from uh, Groundhog Day, right? Um, about what life insurance guys are like. But I, I'm proud to say that one of my primary functions is to help them, individuals understand that they are the number one asset and it ought to be appropriately insured just like their home and their car is. And so protection, super important. Not again, not just life insurance. Um, there's all kinds of things. There's disability and liability and asset protection. There's estate planning, protecting that stuff after you die, right? From state taxes. There's a ton of stuff, a lot of work to be done in that realm. But most people, again, think they can they can get lucky and get to the other end of the, of the curve before anything bad happens. Um, and, you know, again, I, I give a ton of uh, gratitude and thanks to my dear friend, Patrick Donahoe, who was my advisor at Paradigm Life. And 
uh, he taught me in 2011 uh, about this whole thing about control and risk. Like I knew something really bad happened in 2011, but I didn't understand what I did wrong. I didn't understand the control was that important. And so he used Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He calls it hierarchy of wealth. And it's, it comes up in a book of his that I'd be happy to share with folks. Um, and and the, I, the whole point is the amount of control you have over your money, who's got it, what they're doing with it, um, when they're going to give it back. So if you have insight into the answers to those questions and you have control over the results, then the amount of risk you're taking on is the lower. That's just historically across the globe come true. And we see it repeat with all of our clients. And I can, I promise you, it certainly repeated in my life before I met it. Uh, and so this really spoke to my soul. Like I knew in my gut that what he was saying was true because I just experienced it. I just couldn't put it into words or into a visual for people to understand. So if you imagine um, you're an Egyptian building a pyramid that you want to last the test of time for hundreds of years, you would not skip any steps, right? You would do that foundational, really important layer at the bottom, big wide base foundation. And then you would stack the other bricks on top of that, but you wouldn't skip steps and say, oh, I'm bored. You know, I want to go watch a movie. And so you like put all the bricks at the top, right? Because <laughs> then you know it's going to fall over. And so when we look at, you know, con maximum control at the bottom, maximum risk at the top, um, if I were to put my story that I've already told you on here, you know, this isn't everybody's story, but my story, putting it into pictures and how I interacted with my money would look like, you know, would look like I have the first 20 years of my adult life, I'm playing 100% up at the top. I gave no credibility or no credit to needing a large savings account. I didn't put any credit into protecting you know, life insurance either. In fact, I was 21 years old, called my mother and said, hey, mom, that, that life insurance policy you got when I was a baby, I, don't, I think you got taken. She's like, well, I put it in your name and you got it. So do what you want. And so I sold it. And I was like, yes. And me and Dave went out, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then I get married and I have, I look in the eyes of my little young little men that are, that are born and I go, oh my gosh, uh, I need to do something about this because there's some people depending on me. Uh, and so, you know, we learn through life, but I now recognize that everything I had, the way in which I was interacting with my money was way up in speculation. I was just pulling slot machine handles um, because I, I just wasn't doing the, the work. I wasn't visiting the companies or even researching um, that were in all of the mutual funds that I had my money in. And so I was desperate to pull it down into things I directly controlled, like a bunch, like a real estate portfolio. Today I run businesses uh, and I continue like Mr. Randy, to invest in myself, right? I mean, that that is number one asset. Whatever money you put there is going to multiply first. Absolutely. So that's where yeah. we need to begin. We need to get the process of that education piece put in place so that way we can start taking different actions as quickly as you mm -hmm. possibly can, set that foundation, understand that most of what we would call investments out there in the everyday society are really just speculations. They're not... Yeah. They're yeah. just, you're just gambling on somebody else's ideas. Uh, once again, I go back to what I said earlier, the control piece is just, it's way out of whack, which is why I love this pyramid, the hierarchy of wealth that you've, we've, you've presented this to me before. And I love it, which is why I'm so excited that we're going to get into that today, because it's so important to build that foundation and then move up into the different tiers based on your, your risk tolerance at that moment in your life. Absolutely. You know what? I'm reminded when you said that, that the, the truly, you know, in the end, the only scarce resource is time, right? Everything else you can reproduce quickly. You know, that, that old saying about the first million is the hardest one. I'm sure the first billion is too. I'll let you know when I get there, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but uh, the reason the first million is the hardest is because you had to do all that work on yourself to get there. It's easy to reproduce it once you've already been down. The and so, Putting work in yourself, given that time is the only scarce resource, um, putting work in yourself is obviously the most important thing. You know, if, if you wake up one day and you happen to be a, an owner of a very successful racehorses and you have this one young colt that you realize, oh, my gosh, this one could win the Kentucky Derby. Right. Then you want to put the best food in that thing and the, haul it around the best, safest you know, trailer because what is your racehorse? Well, Take the race, the physical racehorse out of the picture and put yourself in the picture. Because in our own worlds, we are the best opportunity we could possibly have. And the reason, again, is because you control that asset 100%. You know, there are people out there that are worried about freedoms today, freedom of all these different things, speech, freedom of arms, you know, to bear arms and, and freedom of our own house and things. Well, guess what? When these things go away one by one, what's the last one? It is ourselves, right? And so, you know, uh, Dr. Viktor Frankl in the, 
uh, you know, in man's search for meaning, when he was, you know, his experiences from the concentration camp, his biggest takeaway, at least my biggest takeaway from his book, was that there was one thing. They strip you of everything. They make you go around naked. Um, so you have no identity. You get a number. But the one thing they could not take away from you is what you put in your mind and what you, how you interpret what you hear. Like you get to decide in the end what that is, right? And so that's why that asset is so doggone important is because you get to control what it produces, right? If you have a, you know, a piece of equipment that you buy to create widgets and it creates them in the wrong size and they don't stay together and they're the wrong color, like, okay, go get another piece of equipment, another you know, widget maker. But you control this widget maker and you get to re reinvent uh, it anytime you want to. I mean, it's unlimited in the value that it can create. So whether it's your fitness, it's having a coach, it's having an accountability partner, it's being nice to your spouse so they're back there supporting you, your kids so that they take over the business after you, like it's working on us in the end, right? Like every time I wanted a person in my life, I'll be humble enough to say my wife often, right? Early in our marriage before I became much more wise. Uh, when I wanted somebody else to change, you know what I had to do to make that happen? The only thing that worked, you probably know, Randy, you probably learned this too. It was change me. Like as soon as I changed me, um, I, I credit the great Zig Ziglar for that because I read, I read a book about uh, courtship after marriage from him at a time when I really needed to hear this. Uh, I was at my wits end, like, why won't she change? You know? And, and then, you know, he basically said in, in courting the redhead, he used to call her, right? Um, he's like, if you treat her the way you treated her when you were trying to gain her favor and have you be the guy she said yes to, then all the problems go away. You know what? He was totally right. All I had to do was work on me. So, uh, I've been on a soapbox a little bit. I promise I won't go after every other element of this that that long. <laughs> but I have learned over time. I have, I you know, I went my first twenty years as an adult. I was up in in speculation, just in the way in which I interacted with my stuff. Again, I didn't spend the time that uh, Warren Buffett spends when he invests in a in a company. I don't have the resources to go. You know, when he invests in it, he's basically running a business, right? Because he takes over controlling interest. He points himself on the board. He, you know, replaces out key members of the company. I was not operating with my market assets, my stocks in that manner. And I didn't even try. Actually, I didn't know I needed to try. And so that, you know, I was, I was way up in speculation. And so I desperately pulled money down into real estate and then I started my own business. And so all this stuff is in the direct world and I get comfortable there. And frankly, I got a little bit of a little cocky. Maybe I was like, you know, eating my own cooking a little too much. And over the last few years, I've started uh, tiptoeing up into more than tiptoeing. I got way over leveraged up in the indirect investing world, which is the next level up of investing. And that is more of a passive role, but it's not quite up in the speculation. So it's, it's me investing in somebody else's business. It's like, I, I tell people, imagine the investment is the car, right? And you're driving the car to some destination, which is a good return, right? So initially, you know, most of us aren't even in the car, right? Like most of our lives, we're busy working our W-2 job, putting food on the table. And when we get money left over at the end, we mail it off to somebody. They put it in a car and the car goes somewhere. We have no idea where the car is even going. We don't even know we're supposed to ask where the car goes. We just hear that the car goes to great places. Um, sometimes the car goes over a cliff and you lose half of it, right? Like happened to me. Um, but you have no control, no insight. And worse, the absolute worst, you don't know you're supposed to. Um, but when somebody like, you know, shakes you, like I'm trying to do, uh, then you realize, oh boy. And often our response was what I did, which is uh, take everything, get it back if you can, and put it into uh, the car that you're now physically driving. And you sit there and drive the car for a while. Well, that feels very gratifying initially. But then there's more and more and more stuff in the car and you got to go more places and you're like, oh my gosh, I need help, right? And that's the advisors you were talking about, right? And so um, I thought that I could, um, and this is possible, but I just haven't done a great job of it yet. I thought that I could just simply hire somebody to drive the car and I go sit in the back. And that's what I call indirect investing or syndication, uh, passive investing, those kinds of. And so um, you notice here, Randy, that I haven't been talking about what the asset is. I did talk about real estate and business, but that's pretty much everything on the planet, right? So that's quite broad. But that could also be the, you know, the guy sitting in the driver's seat that I hired to handle the money for me. He could be still driving us to a destination of real estate, the same exact thing I was personally doing when I was driving, but now it's just somebody else doing it, right? Well, there's this tendency, and I did it, to um, get busy. I'm working on my own business. So I'm back there working on my laptop, my computer, taking phone calls, not really paying as much attention anymore uh, what he's doing, right? And so it can go awry, right? Like there could be a bad person driving the car. 
could be a person who didn't have as much knowledge as I thought they did. And boy, they just kind of, you know, make mistakes, right? And so theoretically, in that world of syndication, of passive investing, you can be involved. You can go check up on things. I have personally visited the apartment buildings and the mobile home parks that I've invested in. Um, but some things I haven't and that didn't go too well, you know? Um, and so I'm now in this kind of world of bounce back. Like I'm bouncing back down into get back in the car and drive it myself. Solve the problem some other way. If I don't feel like I can manage a 200 unit apartment building, hire somebody to do it for me, but actually work towards buying that thing myself. Um, so uh, pausing now for station identification, Mr. Randy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is all fantastic, Gary. Yeah, I just want... So with you explaining the different four tiers, so anybody watching us, you can see we've got yeah. a visual up here. It's got a pyramid with four different tiers of investing. Yeah, and Gary's gone through and specifically we talked about how he's elevated himself up into the upper tier of the speculation, which is considered the most risk. And how because of that risk, he might have had some things maybe go a little bit sideways that he wasn't in control of. And that's kind of what I'm trying to make sure that everybody hears that today. So Gary, if someone's out there and they're realizing maybe at this moment, even today, that they're thinking about, okay, I have X amount and it doesn't matter the dollar amount. It could be a thousand or a million. It doesn't matter. I have excess capital in what I would consider a speculation investment. Mm -hmm. What does that person begin to do? You mentioned a couple of times how you're starting to take control back, get more control of the car, right? We use the car as the metaphor there, but the idea yeah. of we're driving, it's all about the control piece. If right. someone is realizing from this conversation we're having today that, oh my gosh, I I might be out over my skis, where do you advise folks when they come to you with that type of, of an issue or a problem at this point? Yeah, you know, I would do some self-reflection. I would ask uh, other people that you really, truly believe, family members or, de or dear friends, you know, and, and just kind of bounce things off of them. But if you do come to the conclusion of, yes, in fact, I am nervous. This is causing me grief. Uh, I realize that this is inconsistent with um, you know, you guys just verbalized for me on this podcast what I've, you know, that underlying concern that I've been having. So when you realize I am in fact there, um, the first thing you want to do that somebody famously said once that uh, when you realize you're digging in the wrong place or you're digging a hole, stop digging, right? And so uh, if your money is exposed to a place that is no longer consistent with your values or um, your level of comfort, um, you realize I don't have an emergency fund. And somebody told me once that I could put the money in my safe stocks, but now I realize stocks aren't safe in the way in which at least I'm operating with them. Then then stop digging. And what that looks like is just put it into cash. Like you can just go to the brokerage account and sell the stocks and put it into cash. And then you have protected 100% from the loss. That's not a long-term retirement plan strategy, you know, but it is an immediate way to go to protection or go to safety. And then you want to say, okay, now I need to improve my own skills and come up with this forward plan, right? And so the, you know, get a little deeper into my story, I was moving everything from speculation down into tier two, which is we call direct investing, the lowest level of investing, the highest control level. And I was putting it into real estate. Why? Well, the other thing that was happening in 2011, um, by the way, this was an amazing time to buy real property, but I didn't know that at the time. Uh, I was, the reason I was moving so quickly is because I'd lost everything in the market, but I, but also be, oh, because they were talking about at the federal reserve level, right? All the newscasters were talking about this thing, this new thing called quantitative easing. And they had done quantitative easing one, QE one, and that worked out okay. And so they were talking about QE two and QE three, and there were rumors of QE infinity. And that took me back to my childhood, which result, printing money resulted in homelessness. <laughs> and so I didn't want to be locked to my W-2 career in the military and not being around my boys. And I didn't want to lose more since I'd already just lost half of it. And so I knew I had to get to a place to protect myself. And so I started looking into gold and silver. And then uh, thankfully learned about real estate, learned about the multi-dimensions, the ideal investment things we talked about. And I plowed it into real estate with long-term fixed rate loans. And that has made all the difference in the world for me. My idea was that if they print money, inflation is going to come immediately and all these assets are going to go up in value. I'm going to have the flippers on and be able to swim up river, right? Well, it didn't happen for like 10 years. All I got was the tenants and toilets and slow cash flow. Uh, but I stayed true to the fact that I could predict the future and it wasn't getting away from me like the previous stuff had. Uh, and then all of a sudden in 2021 and 2022, a lot of these things did double in value. Uh, and so eventually it happened. 
And my hat's off to them for holding that at bay for 10 years. I don't know how they did it, but it still came. And, you know, it's going to again, right? It, I don't personally think, um, when I look at, uh, let me just back up. I heard a very sobering economist uh, podcast this morning talking about what I'm feeling in my gut, which is that there was this period in the 70s where we thought we'd gotten inflation out under control. Lyndon Johnson, uh, you know, shook the Federal Reserve chairman and said, I want lower interest rates. And so he brought the rates down way too early. And we got this massive run after that. And I feel like that's what we're doing right now, personally. I think that's what we're doing right now. And so I'm buying still, buying as many hard assets as I can, um, because it's, again, they're just big flippers that you put on when inflation does actually run. So that's important. But when I, when I was getting ready to do that, I met Patrick Dono and he's telling me about these concepts. And he said, hey, by the way, you know that underneath all of these investments, and my very simple definition of investment is that you know, I try to teach like Robert Kiyosaki has all these years, right? To an eighth grader or an eight-year-old, I forget what he says, but simple, right? And and I, I try to say that investments are me sending my money off, risking never seeing it again. Like I could 100% lose that money. And I have <laughs> more times than I want to count, uh, but I'm doing it because I've made it, I've, I've educated myself and I've made a calculated decision that, that it's likely it's going to bring back friends, right? My money's going to bring back friends. And so I'm going to get a return on my investment. I'm going to grow it faster than if I kept it in a safe, liquid, guaranteed location. But underlying all those investments is the foundation. And that is this uh, thing that you often will hear called infinite banking. But it is, uh, we, you know, there's lots of names. I call it family banking because it is your family's personal banking system. And it's just a more efficient place to save and grow your emergency fund, reserves for your businesses and your real property if you have those just, you know, liquidity that you need sitting around. And then it becomes this source where you're storing capital, you're going to go invest. And so if you're making long-term investments, not like a, a short-term, uh, you know, one-week investment into a, a stock that's moving upward, but rather buying into a rental property, purchasing a business, even purchasing your, your primary residence or a car, some big capital thing. Um, I always borrow against my family bank um, so that my money can sit there and grow uh, in the background without tax and compound. Uh, and so it's it's just a different way to use the banking function for your family. It also adds protection on the number one asset because it is whole life insurance. And so it guarantees that even if you go to age 121 or you die tomorrow, your family will be protected, meaning that that income they expected would come during your lifetime is still going to come no matter what. Um, this sounds cheesy, but I decided. So I went to a, a Naval Academy family, or a Naval Academy uh, reunion. It was our 25th, I think, reunion. And I'm walking around and I'm like, okay, first of all, what happened to these guys? They're all really old. I don't know if that's ever happened to you guys, but <laughs> I was like, what happened to them? Right. Cause I'm still 25 in my mind. Um, of course. And then uh, the other thing was they just kept telling me these stories about, you know, did you know that so and so got cancer or this guy had this problem or whatever? And so I'm like, man, we're falling apart. And so I reflected on that. I'm like, hey, I want my, this, you know, I have this dream of what the future is going to look like for my grandkids and great grandkids. And I'm not, I can't guarantee it's going to happen. So I got busy and, and just decided I'm going to put in uh, another piece, another element. I got six life insurance policies on myself at this point. And the last one, it's actually term insurance. It's a guaranteed convertible term insurance because I wanted to have an amount of money. And it was twice what I had in these whole life policies, right? So I, I designed the whole life policy to be a bucket to catch cash. And, and over the years, as you add more and more cash to it, it's very flexible on what you put in, how much you put in. But then once it's in there, it's going to grow without tax and you get to leverage it for anything, right? Um, so I was creating the buckets based on how much cash I wanted to catch at the time. First year, I wanted to catch $80,000 a year. Um, and then a couple of years later, I was like, I need to catch another 40000 So I put another one in place, right? And so I had five of those things, but I didn't, but I never really thought about the death benefit. I just made it as small as possible because it made it grow faster. But then I, this time I wanted twice as much actual death benefit and I wanted to be able to create these little banks in the future. But here's a kicker. In the future, you got to be insurable. And I wasn't sure based on you know that experience, I was going to be. And so, and I was just moving to Florida and we have all kinds of sunshine, beautiful sunshine down here, right? Skin cancer. So I was like, all right, I'm going to lock in that I can do this. And so I have this big convertible term insurance policy that for the next several years, whenever I want to, I can take a chunk of it and create another policy. It's like having, you know, buying a big plot of land and you're a builder, but you don't have 
the capacity to build on it today. So you just kind of land banked it, but you also got it zoned, right? And so zoning in this case is like when I got approved for the life insurance and it's a guaranteed convertible one. So now when I'm ready to go put 10 houses on it, I don't need to go ask the city. I just start building the houses, right? And so when I want to make the next family bank, I just take a chunk of it and turn it into the next one, even for my hospital bed in the middle of cancer or something. So the reason I tell that story is because this is quite, you know, all encompassing the, the approach in which we take to help individuals sustain and grow their wealth and then create legacy, which is, again, the education side of things. But I was able to snap my fingers in that moment. I came home from that event, reflected on it and said, I want to guarantee that my great grandkids have what I want them to. Have. And all I had to do is sign some papers and pay an annual premium and they are going to get it whether I'm here or not. And to me, that's super important. Love that. Cause that's what I'm trying to get built out for myself as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, in small pieces, right? Small chunks. Yeah. And that's yeah. where having the advice from yourself, the wisdom, uh, you shared a ton of stories and that's also very helpful because you can put yourself into those similar situations, maybe not the same, but very similar and realizing that, okay, if I take action today, get control, I can then start taking different action. And with that different action, obviously you're going to get a different outcome. I mean, you're talking great grandkids. I'm thinking that as well. That's what I'm encouraging my listeners to begin thinking about also, right? You need to be thinking beyond, I have children, right? I have grandchildren now or a grandchild, but beyond that, that's to me, that's what I, I'm thinking that far out. And that's exactly what you're talking about with this policy uh, that, mm -hmm. that you've described here so far, which is fantastic. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it is two quick things came up. One on that topic. So it's a lot harder when you're thinking that far out. You know, I, I reflect on, um, gosh, I don't remember who it was. It, maybe it was Napoleon Hill. I don't remember who it was, sadly. But, you know, he basically he said, or Jim Rohn. No, it was Jim Rohn. Yeah. He said, um, here I am, you know, with the encyclopedia, Jim Rohn, Randy Wilson, and I'm about to quote the wrong guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, you know, you should make it a, a goal to become a millionaire, not because of the million dollars, because of the person you have to become to, to achieve that, right? And maybe we should make that 10 million now today, but, but you know, a million is still pretty doggone hard in my mind. My point though, in, in doing that was like, think about what, what you have to put in place and how much you have to think through it. If you're like, I want to make sure my great grandkids are able to do something. That's harder. Like you got to write this stuff down and you have to not just have experiences with your kids, but you have to make sure the grandkids get it too. Right. And so it's, that's hard. Like not too many families actually succeed in that. That's why in every country on the planet, there is something, there's, there is a phrase that means the same thing as the American three generations from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeve, right? So I'm first generation money, you're first generation money. And we were the dudes in the shirt sleeves that got to something because we had a vision and, and the focus and worked on ourselves, et cetera. Our kids saw us do it. My kids understand that I work really hard. They actually don't want to work as hard as I do. And so that's part of the challenge, right? <laughs> um, but you need to eventually impart that it's important. Um, but their kids aren't going to see me working hard. They're going to just see that we have some money for some reason, right? They're not going to understand why they're going to be nice and comfortable. And so if you're not careful, if you don't have this lasting thing in place, I'm just going to be the next statistic in the three generations, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. You know, in, in Japan or maybe China, I forget which, I think it's China. It is uh, three generations, rice patties to rice patties. <laughs> you know, it's like every country has this that relates to their to their group. So that, that was one huge thing that I was thinking of um, when you said that. The other thing was uh, you were, you mentioned that I use pictures when I teach. And if I could just impart to all of you out there that want to get your message across, and obviously we all do, right? We're all selling something. Um, you know, we're selling our to our spouse that we want to go to our restaurant. We're selling to our kids that they shouldn't just do computer games. So we're always selling. That's just human interaction. And I don't think we should ever think of sales as a bad uh, thing. And so, yes, I'm selling to you that I think that this is a great way to grow well. I'm also selling that I might be a good advisor to have on your team, right? So, I mean, let's just be real. We're doing that. One of the, if I could uh, just give you something I've learned over the, the years of being on stages across the country, that if you are serious about, well, first of all, take Zig Ziglar's advice. And if you're going to sell pots and pans, uh, you know, buy the pots and pans and use them, right? <laughs> like I have more life insurance than any of my clients do. Well, maybe not more than they do, but more of my net worth in life insurance than anyone I know. Um, because I'm all in on, and I didn't, 
decide to sell life insurance because a buddy said that might be a good idea and then get all in. I did it the other way around, which I think is important. Like, what are you passionate about? And go do that and share it. Uh, and then make sure that you tell your personal stories. So the reason that my stories have historically worked with people when I talk to them, have connected with them and enabled me to help them take action is because they're real and they come from your heart, your soul, right? And this energy comes screaming out of you when you're speaking from your heart, from your soul. If you want me to talk about the pros and cons of owning a flower shop, well, I could talk about business ownership, but how about the pros and cons of wearing different kinds of women's dresses? Like, I'm going to fail. <laughs> you know, like, that's <laughs> that one's pretty in red. Like, I, you know, I'm going to fail because there's no energy. So I just thought, you know, I, I just wanted to share that. Like, my biggest level of being able to help individuals take action comes when I'm completely raw with them and I tell them where my passions lie. So, you know, I'm not anti-markets at all. I'm just anti doing it the way I did it. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Um, and, and, and I don't want to go out and talk about the virtues of it because I'm not good at it and I would not sell it well. So you just, you have to be, you have to be passionate about what you're talking to people about. And if you are, if you are, you feel like you're in a safe enough place um, and that it's important enough to talk about your thing and um, that you can get vulnerable about it, it, it makes a huge difference, huge difference. Agreed. Very much so, which is why the podcast uh, we didn't even mention. You have your own podcast. You're out there educating folks, talking about your passions. I do. I'm we hoping there's a get into here for those who are able to watch, but I'm not sure there is. No, nope, guess not. Sorry. It's called Gary's Gulch. Thank you for Gary's for Gulch. Yes, yeah. Gary's Gulch. Uh, so we'll definitely have a link in the show notes, folks, uh, whether you're listening to this on a podcast or definitely watch it on YouTube, something like that. We'll have yeah. a, a link to Gary's podcast as well. So if you found value in what Gary's message has been so far today. We didn't really go into a lot of deep detail at this point because I think that we're going to bring Gary back on if we can get some people to raise their hands and say, yeah, that, that I want to learn more, right? He had mentioned the idea about whole life policies and using insurance as an investment vehicle to start putting in that foundation for yourself. Once again, I'm not the expert Gary is. So if I'm speaking at a turn or not saying that correctly, Gary, please correct me. But that's how I've learned from Gary teaching me how these things are put into place. He's helped me begin the process. I'm nowhere near where I want to be yet, but between myself, my wife, uh, we're coming up with a plan and we're going to try to execute that with Gary's help. And through his advisory, try to think through putting mm -hmm. things in place for my grandchildren, for my great grandchildren. And then also for my wife and I too, right? It's not that we're not going to enjoy ourselves as we go along, but at the same time, it's a little bit of planning that if we can do a little bit today, obviously we can take a little bit uh, for that in the future as well. Any thoughts I, on that? Yeah. Well, I would say that um, you are exactly where you want to be because you're waking up every day excited to grow and um, and spend another day on the journey because the journey actually is the point, right? Uh, you know that as well as I do. You've taught me a ton uh, on on personal development. Um, my one of my favorite books is a tiny little book called "The Obstacle Is the Way" uh, by Brian. Uh, I forgot his name, but um, you know th the point is like the obstacle is not in your way; it is the point. <laughs> like getting through that obstacle, and then the next one, and then the next one means that you're just experiencing the journey and learning from it, and that is the whole point. I've heard, haven't seen this video, uh, but I've heard that when the the ground, uh, not the groundhog, the groundhog, the greyhound, when the greyhound running around the track catches the rabbit, it's not pretty because that thing's electrocuted, right? So like you don't want uh, actually to get to your journey sometimes. It's not a pretty result. And so many people, you know, they, they get to the goal, which was retirement, which is so sad. Like, you know, their entire working life, they just wanted to get to a point where they didn't have to do this anymore. And then when they get there, there is no finish line in front of them. They're at the end. And being at the end is a super scary place to be. Um, you don't have purpose in life and there's no reason to keep moving forward and going up. And so life and humans are like this marble on the top of the hill. It's either going forward or backwards. And and I suggest you always keep pushing the goalposts out and keep moving forward. Um, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, the infinite banking, like what does it represent? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to oversimplify and so far it hasn't made me go bankrupt, but there's a lot of people out there going the other direction. They're like, oh no, you got to learn about this thing. It's a Swiss army knife. It can do everything. Like you can do your laundry for you, right? <laughs> and so, but, but I'm not that guy. I'm like, hey, sorry, but it's a bucket. It's a bucket that you store your cash in that works a whole lot better than a savings and checking account when it comes to money that you're saving long-term. 
I'm not the guy who's going to go on to TikTok and tell you how you can make a bunch of money by, you know, paying your groceries from this, like every, every week taking a loan. Like that's not me because I can show you the math where it's not worth your time. Um, but large things, massive difference, quick, very quick, you know, no visual here because I already turned it off, but just you conceptually in your mind. Um, I was buying my first rental property in 2011, had just put these policies in place. I needed 50 K more for a down payment on this property, still own it. It's a 14110 Volpe Drive down in San Antonio, Texas. And big four plug, it was a nice property. It almost bankrupted me at the beginning. That's a story for another day, but I learned a lot about real estate in that first one. And, and so I needed 50K more. There was room in the policy for it. And the question I was struggling with was, should I put the money in the policy, borrow against it, and use their money to put the down payment on the property? I asked real estate mentors. I did what, what Randy said, right? I went and asked a bunch of people. Well, there weren't that many that, that understood what I was doing or had actually looked deeply into it. I found a couple guys who had, thankfully. But most of the people are like, hey, uh, this little amortization schedule that you're showing us here, how you're going to take the net cash flow and use it to pay off the loan, it's going to take you like 25 years to pay it off. And you're going to pay $47,000 in interest on a $50,000 loan. That's, you know, you've heard all this before. That's offensive. You should pay it off in 15 years. Use cash only, you know, do all that kind of stuff, right? And, and that's because that math is all correct, by the way. But, but that is half the story. The other half of the story is interesting. Yes, $47,000 over 25 years. I mean, if you make it a long enough time, it's a massive amount of money. But 47K over 20, uh, 25 years. So the question is, what can my money do during that period of time? What is the opportunity cost of sticking my money in that property for 25 years, right? And if I so happen to have this, this tool, this savings vehicle, my own family bank bucket that could grow at 6%, with no tax compounding every year, then uh, $50,000 over 25 years turns into $215,000. And so that's a $165,000 growth on that original 50. So I grew by 165, but I had this little 47K that I had to pay somebody. Now, all of a sudden, it sounds different. So I call that opportunity cost of using cash. And that means that when you spend, when you pay for something with cash, then it could have grown to become some big amount over your lifetime. And it's not going to do that because it's gone, right? And so in this example, 215 minus 47, that's $118,000 mistake for using cash as a down payment. And oh, by the way, the biggest mistake that would have been there would have been had I used cash, there would not have been the $2 million in death benefit that that policy had. And about six months later, this is just how I rolled, <laughs> I had... Uh, talked to my wife about property number two, and then I got a package opportunity for properties three, four, and five. And I went all in because I'm like, okay, I did this. She said, yes. Okay. And then I realized we're at, we're at an anniversary dinner and in a public place, nice restaurant. And I'm like, honey, I have a surprise for our anniversary. I just, I'm in contract on three more properties. She drops her, di her, her, uh, <laughs> silver spoon on the China. Everyone in the, in the restaurant is looking around. And she's like, you is red faced. You have got to stop. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God. So I was smart enough to be quiet for a little bit there. Let the emotions drop, draw down and people stop looking at me. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and I said, you know, um, and she, and she calmed down too. And she was, and she explained, she was like, I'm, I'm deep into my nursing, I don't know, certification here. She was an engineer becoming a nurse. And she's like, I, I don't know anything at all about real estate and you're off here doing this stuff. And she's like, you have how much, how much, you know, de um, debt right now? I'm like, well, about 1.2 million in debt. And she's like, exactly. Like, I don't know what to do with it. What if you died tomorrow? What would I do with that? And that caused me to realize, oh, remember how we funded these things with those crazy physicals we had to do on a Saturday morning? There's $2 million of death benefits. So like, I don't want to die, but if I did, you could pay off the homes or you could um, give the bank the homes and, and take the $2 million. And I just kind of said that as my defense, trying to keep my head above water. And I could see, physically see the color fade from her face. And she's like, all right, well, tell me more about that, right? And it was the first time in my, mo in my life of having the policies already for like three or four years that I realized there's actually a value to this death benefit thing. Because, you know, young guys, we're, we're like, you know, we're not going to die like these other weird people do, but not us, right? Like that's how <laughs> we're wired. So anyway, that's why that was the value of not using cash in that first example. And it, it sold me for life. Like I'm, I'm all in. As you can tell. <laughs> well, and that's where learning about that, right? Learning the uh, the different philosophies, the different, uh, mm -hmm. just the ways of doing things. And that's where bringing yeah. somebody on like yourself 
on the team to try to just even bounce ideas. I actually have an idea that I need to share with you offline that I need to just get an opinion on. And I'm looking forward to that conversation because I'll, I stated in once again, the ep- recorded uh, the episode that I recorded today, I was talking about how I, I bounce, I get collect ideas for mm-hmm. both sides, positive mm-hmm. and negative, whatever different forms. And then I obviously create a thesis and then I try to project forward where that's going to take me. And that's kind of yeah. where I've got myself. I've got myself to where I've collected my data. Now I need to like present it to somebody to help me flush out, make sure that that's a good idea or not. And that's the importance of having somebody on your team. And that's a fantastic approach to hear both sides, right? When you get, and I'll admit it politically, you can, you can, can probably all guess, but politically I'm kind of uh, stovepiped. And, and so I can't understand the people on the other side, which is not good. Like I, I need to remain intellectually curious and, and open-minded, right? And so you, you're taking an, an amazing approach. If what you meant by like both sides was people who are for or against something, again, that's incredible, right? And I don't actually think there are bad investments. The markets have clearly made people a lot of money. Real estate has clearly made people a lot of money. Our own personal businesses, I think, you know, this goes back to, you know, the richest man in Babylon days, right? Like th- th- that goes way back. Business is how we survived. We created goods and services that the community needed and we, and somebody paid us for it and that put food on our table. Um, so there are no, I don't know who said this, maybe it was, I don't know, you'll tell me because you know more about quotes, but there are no bad investments, right? Just bad investors. I think that's Kiyosaki, but, um, but, but, but you can make money with a deal. You just have to be the right person to make money with that deal. Um, it can definitely be, I can be a very bad investor. Let's go back to women's dresses. Somehow I'm stuck there or I'm working with, uh, I'm, I'm trying to work with, uh, business owners, right? And so. Uh, I'm, believe it or not, this is like, I think humor, I think God has humor, but he connected me up with this amazing group, um, who are salon owners. So I'm talking to all these beautiful women in their thirties, trying to tell my wife, like, no, no kidding. This is, this is legit. You know, I'm going on this trip. Right. But then I get on stage and I realize I'm the only dude in the room with no hair. Um, but you know, anyway, I don't know how I went on that tangent. Um, (laughs) oh, I think it was about not being, you know, me investing in salons, probably not a good call uh, or hair at least. Um. <laughs> well, like you said business is business, partnerships yeah. and teams and yeah. philosophies. Once you get the basic, I talk a lot of time, basic financial education. Mm-hmm. If you can just learn certain terms, we've thrown around some different terms even today. I would recommend you go back and re-listen to parts of this episode and get those terms written down somewhere and then go investigate what they mean. Uh, go reach out to Gary, uh, get on his and listen to his podcast. He will talk a lot more in depth about some of the subjects we've talked about today. That's the beauty about technology these days is that you can quickly get yourself up to speed versus having to go to the library or or how mm-hmm. things used to be even just 10, 15, 12 years ago or mm-hmm. 10, 15, 12, 20 years ago is what I was trying to say. But you can do that, but it takes effort. You've got to try. You've got to take control. And if you do that, you can exponentially see some great, great gains in your life. I'm living proof of it. And it sounds like you've yep. been that way too as well, Gary. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I'm extremely excited about is this trend of baby boomers who, okay, this part I'm not excited about. The baby boomer generation worked uh, pretty hard to grow businesses and they learned from the greatest generation. So those three, three generations, shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves, we're talking about it here right now, right? So the greatest generation, the World War II generation came home from World War II. They were all fired up about America and they started running and creating businesses and adding value. And that was the industrial revolution. I mean, we did amazing things, right? And the baby boomers are like, well, I guess what we're supposed to do is work our tail off, right? But then they get tired, right? And they're telling their kids, grandpa worked his tail off. I worked my tail off. Well, the generation coming after that, which I guess is the millennials, right? Um, they don't want to do that, right? They don't want their parents' business. And, and so there is this, there are massive numbers of small, unsexy businesses. The, the dude who's out there, you know, moving the porta potties around, the guy who's hauling the trash. No one wants those businesses. The kids don't want the businesses. So there's, you know, there's a little bit of a failure there in, in the whole legacy side of things, which, you know, is sobering. Um, but, um, but there's also an amazing opportunity for those of us who are humble enough to say, I just want to put some effort into myself and then leverage that into my own business, right? Um, which is an extension of us, right? And then get some employees to work for it. And now it becomes passive, true passive income that you can count on. And, and so I'm excited to get my boys excited 
to start small businesses, you know, or, or buy small businesses, right? Go find the guy who's got a plumbing company, who's got 15 or HVAC or whatever, like things that are not going to go after, go, go out of business. Like AI is not going to replace the need for the human to be cool, right? <laughs> or have the plumbing work. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I'm excited about that. I'm, and there's, there's some really smart uh, young people on LinkedIn um, that, you know, I buy boring businesses or, you know, whatever, and they're helping, like they're mentors. I'm going to have some 30 year old guy mentoring me and my kids about how to do this. Cause I'm, I'm serious. I'm going to go out and find these businesses to operate in my, in my hometown. Like we think that all we can do because it was in Robert Kiyosaki's book is have a laundromat or a car wash. Well, let me tell you, the news is out on those two. Like those things are not <laughs> inexpensive businesses, <laughs> but I bet you the plumbing company that's between the two of them on the street is super inexpensive because no one wants to sit at the restaurant or the bar and tell their buddy that, you know, I fix toilets. Right. Uh, and so, but it's important. And talk about, you know, I like real estate because it has universal need. So does plumbing. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And that's part of the process of getting that philosophy for yourself, getting your own investment philosophy. I know the uh, real estate guys who talk about that. Uh, Robert Helms yeah. talks about that, gaining and creating your own investment philosophy. And that's part of it. But we're, my wife and I were actually in that process as well, trying to figure out that business piece. And we're looking at potentially either we're involved with the, she's involved with a business that it doesn't appear that the transition of legacy is going to move from the current owners to the children. And so we're going to just try to see what that looks like. We're not sure. Is uh, it a wedding, wedding venue business that yeah, you were? Yeah, is. cool. Yeah, Very cool. That's a passion. Is. So that's a good fit. And that's exactly what she wants to do. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll we'll go down that road and see how that works. Same thing. That type of an experience isn't going to be offset with AI or automation right. or I mean, parts of the business might be, but the experience itself will not be. So yeah, we're kind of going down that path as well and trying to figure out how we can put those pieces in place for us from a business standpoint. Yeah. Amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Appreciate Incredible. that. Incredible. Yes. So I think uh, uh, audience votes willing. Uh, I think we should get back and, and talk about, you know, how do you design these things and why is it important to use one tool versus another? I mean, there's a lot of different ways in which people are trying to do this infinite banking thing or family banking. Um, and, and they may all work, but there's some that are guaranteed to work. And that's kind of important. Very important. I didn't know how, yes, very important. That's super important. You know, there again, we keep talking about having teammates and advisors yeah. and all that. And that's super, super important. So Gary, if folks are out there today. They're like, okay, I understand what you're saying. I'm in that top. Mm -hmm. four, tier four, tier three, something like that. And they're like, I need to figure out what to do. Uh, we talked about your podcast. That'd be a great place for people to start. But if they yeah. want to get in contact with you, maybe just have a, a quick conversation, uh, get more of an idea of where they can start taking more of control of their finances and their wealth moving forward. What are those best places to do that? Yeah, I would say probably like I am, this is a weird thing from the Navy nuclear submarine force. Like they always had to know where you were. So you had to make sure that your email inbox was or your message box was empty before you were able to go off on your own and go do things. So then it kind of released the leash, if you will. And so I'm just, I grew up like being really good at my, my emails. I'm horrible at many other methods of communication. So, you know, I, I think just my website, Gary at Gary Pinkerton.com is just G-A-R-Y. And then the color pink E-R-T-O-N. So Gary at Gary Pinkerton.com. And I guarantee you, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and uh, drop it or lose it. So, and you know, you can see my podcast right there on that one. It's got a weird title. It's Gary's Gulch. It it harkens back to it's a it's a um, hat tip to um, Ayn Rand and the book Atlas Shrugged, trying to achieve what she told us was important in that book. So, um, not an easy read or not a quick read, uh, but it, you'll get the point. If you want to understand what the podcast and my vision and everything is about, go back and find the first two or three episodes, and I just walk through it. Um, same thing Randy did on his. Love it. Love it. So yeah, folks, I highly recommend get a hold of Gary. Uh, just go and get some of the resources that he has available, right? I know he has uh, different free mm -hmm. offers as well. And that can probably mm -hmm. be found at that same website. Is that not correct? Exactly. Gary, at yep. GaryPickerton.com. Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll have all those links in the show notes. Uh, the process of getting yourself self-educated getting yourself to take control of your own life, of your own wealth, of your own legacy, the, the topics that we're talking about today, it starts with the decision. You need to make a decision that you are not going to allow anyone within your ability 
to take things from you that they shouldn't, whether it's inflation, whether it's you're losing things because of bad investments because or, or anything else like that. And the ability to take control is so important, as I mentioned at the very beginning, and I've mentioned in other parts of the podcast before. Unfortunately, my father did not have those things set up for my family. And it hurts me because I know he would have if he would have known, which is why we're having this conversation today. I want you to become aware that these things are possible. I want you to become aware that you just need to get yourself educated to begin starting taking different steps moving forward. And I'm confident that when you learn these basic terms, basic things, you can then set yourself up, you, your family, your future family, uh, for greater things down the road that, uh, yeah, it's going to be so much fun. I'm super excited to hear those things for you as we move forward from 2024 and beyond. So Gary, man, yeah, like you said, uh, the audience willing and asking us to come back. I will definitely, if I'll take you up on it, if you're interested, uh, we'll try to get another one on the calendar. Uh, maybe we'll get through this election cycle. Uh, and maybe towards the end of the year, maybe first of the year, something like that. We'll try that again. We'll dive a little bit deeper into the subject and uh, give people a little bit more context as far as uh, specific things that they can start doing for themselves. How's that sound? That's awesome. I look forward to it, my friend, any day. Fantastic. So folks, go out there, have a fantastic day. Uh, share with us with your family and friends. If you're checking us out on YouTube, uh, like and subscribe. We, I would greatly appreciate that. Go follow Gary out there as well, him and his podcast. And uh, yeah, share this with as many people as you possibly can. Help us spread the message of the Rich Mind podcast out there as far and as wide as possible. So go out, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back with the next episode again very soon. Until then, bye now. <laughs> 